You've landed on The Substance, a podcast aiming at being biblical, thoughtful, and human. Join us each week as we engage the culture without the culture war. I'm Trevor Aiken, joined by Philip Marinello. Hey, everybody. What's going on? And Vincent Edwards. Howdy, howdy. And joining us live. And we're looking at his face on Zencaster because it just For the updated. first time, wow. <laughs> Flame. We, got, we got the man Flame, hey. Marcus Gray. How are you, sir? What's Welcome up? to The Substance. What's up, gents? Thanks for having me, man. It's going to be fun. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm sure plenty of the people, uh, plenty of your fans came and clicked on the show, already know you a little bit. For some of the listeners who may not know you, for some of the Substance fans who may not be familiar, you want to give us a quick bio of yourself and your body of work, and then maybe a minute or two about how you initially came to faith? Yeah, for sure. So um, my artist name is Flame. I am from St. Louis, Missouri, born and raised. I grew up influenced by rap music, hip hop culture, also influenced by Christianity. So I was trying to keep those two in the balance. But um, I think the things that came along with the rap lifestyle for me at one point just contradicted my faith. So Mm. just through a series of events, I almost lost my life in a tragic accident. And then following that, I lost my grandmother, my dearest and best friend. The Lord mm. used that to get me to asking the big questions in life. Why am I here? What's the point? And then I was invited to church after uh, sort of drowning myself in sin and depression. In one of my homies' house, whose dad had just got life in prison. And mm. uh, man, I heard the gospel and it spoke to me and it, and it called me and God delivered faith to me. And I said, I want this. And uh, he saved me at 16 years old. So I've been writing music just to tell his story through, um, through the scriptural lens. My experience through that, and uh, that just brings me to delving deep into theology and trying to show how practical it is for our regular, mundane, and the highs and lows of our human experience. So that is me, Flame. I love that, bro. So we want to have our foc- our main focus on this show, because we only have so much time. We could probably talk for hours, <laughs> and we'd love to talk more down the road. But um, sure. before we get into the new projects, how old were you when your self-titled debut dropped? Uh, uh, let me see, 2004, approximately. <laughs> approximately. Well, you know, a, a rapper never tells his age like a woman. <laughs> like a woman I guess I could Google it. Me. I was unfamiliar with that one. <laughs> That's like asking a woman how much she weighs or if she's pregnant. You feel me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you're not pregnant, Flame. That'd be a different podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll just say uh, I was just getting started. Let me see, probably in the earlier stages of my adult life, uh, teen years too. But my first record came out 2004, so. There you go. And I don't want to get all gushy and fanboy here, but I will say, I mentioned this to you before, I've been listening to hip hop my whole life as a developed person. And um, as far as uh, CHH goes, Rewind is still on my top five. So thank you for that. I've, I can't tell you how many people I shared uh, We Preach Christ with and Give Us the Truth. It's love that. That's dope, bro. Thank you. Yeah, that's some of my favorite songs, man. Uh, yeah, I think that's a pivotal record for me, Defining Moments. So yeah, that means a lot. Thank you, bro. And like concept album too. Like we'll we'll put a link into it in the show notes. The whole album is like a radio show. And like <laughs> yeah. a lot of rap song a lot of rap albums have skits and stuff that are just kind of whatever. Yeah. But like the whole idea of the record is a radio show concert deal and it's it's just a great it's great from top to bottom. That's dope. Mm. Thank so, you, man. Done gushing here. That's <laughs> that's what yeah i love it man i've been listening also to uh y'all yours and the truth uh complicated ish mm, podcast yeah and one of the topics that you brought up was kind of the emphasis in calvinism on like you depraved wretch you know <laughs> you worm yeah. you know that is the yeah. emphasis of total depravity and that's true right it's a biblical thing as well but then like how that that is kind of a different cultural standpoint from maybe the church culture of like you know god is for you he is with you there's no condemnation in christ like you have uh you know god is is your friend in that sense it, it when you are in christ mm-hmm. and so gentle and feeling lowly. empowered yeah dane ortland's uh, gentle and lowly is is kind of like a a wake-up call to a lot of folks who have grown up in this other thing where where do you think that that has come from and what was that what's that shift in emphasis is it a doctrinal problem or is it an emphasis problem is it a cultural problem 
Yeah, I, I would say it's uh, probably all the above. I think, um, you know, it's, it's one thing when you develop a theological construct based on um, what you're not, who you're against. Hundred yeah. percent. You know what I mean? Hundred percent. You're, on you're that. sort of on the negative. You can feel that, and I think that's what the Puritans, um, not in totality, but I think a large part of what they were going for was to contrast themselves against um, Lutheran Reformed thought, um, Roman Catholicism, especially. You know, and they really wanted to differentiate themselves from all forms of deviation, all forms of worldliness so they really put the emphasis on uh not pride but that's sort of um we're the we're the puritans <laughs> it's in the name yeah. you know what i mean they sort of wrote that and <laughs> <laughs> that's true <laughs> you feel me so they put that in the name but by contrast it really um put the pressure on people to see themselves as sinners as filthy maggots as uh <laughs> some of those guys would say and and it's just to me it oversteps what the Bible is communicating and getting at in terms of the plight of the human condition. So, mm. yeah, it can get very discouraging and dark if you stay in that place. Yeah. I was also thinking about it because around the same time I was listening to a book by, are you familiar with Karen Swallow Pryor? She has a book on reading well mm. is the title of it. And she was saying that kind of the quintessential difference between conservative thought and progressive thought, both theologically, politically, that kind of thing, is on on that question, on the state of man. Mm. And that, like, the conservative thought is kind of defined by, like, man is like evil man at is base. Yeah. And progressive thought is like, well, at base, man isn't bad. And it's funny, because, like, I would consider myself five-point, right? Like, I believe in total depravity, mm -hmm. but at the same time, do you think that's true? Do you find that to be true? And like, how do you think that those things engage? Like, how do you think total depravity like informs your approach to the world or your approach to, or even how you love like, the folks in your own church? Yeah, yeah, I, I love it. So I think that there is a sort of a um, uh, people are sort of missing each other in the conversation. So mm -hmm. culturally, when people are talking about the goodness of man, and in my estimation, and trying to sort of get at the um, you know, that there's something in us that is salvageable. We're not as bad as we can be. It seems like those are responses to cultural norms, meaning mm -hmm. they're dealing with people who may come up in, you know, rough households who've been abused, who uh, struggle with sort of personal worth and are trying to lift them up. So I guess theologically, you have a set of Christians who may be considered on the liberal side, but their hearts bend towards picking those people up, informing them that God does care for them. He did create them in a way that they're worthy of dying for. And when they hear more conservative theological language, such as total depravity, total, um, you know, uh, what's the other use where they try to get away from total depravity? Um, total inability. Is that the one? It, one of those. It's uh, those. Yeah. That kind of language is, I think, you know, people on the sort of liberal theological side are trying to get away from the connotation that that carries. So I think both have great intentions behind them and both are true, but there's sort of mm -hmm. a clash in what they're intending to communicate. One is talking theologically, and it seems like one is talking culturally in terms of catching people before they fall into cracks into dark suicidal state of mind, you know. So I think uh, both are true, that uh, there is something in humanity that is worthy of Jesus dying for, that if you don't, you know, take your time to pastorally explain what you mean by total depravity, theologically, it can get lost on that person. And then they'll, you know, sort of be drowned in that misunderstanding. So I think it's just we have to right kind of slow down and better describe and define what we mean with these phrases. If it's too liberal leaning, we have to catch that as well and be fed mm -hmm. up with right theology because that's not for sure. Either. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and that's. Yeah. That's what we're all about here. I think a good, maybe a bridge from some of your old work, some of the stuff we're talking about to your new projects here is just the the reality and the ideas of doubt that believers experience when it comes to struggling with besetting sins or even maybe just getting caught in various ruts of bad habits, behaviors, things that they can't overcome, that they're trying to overcome. Talk about, because I mean, let me give you, I guess, a little prompt. You wanted, you talked about back in 2005 and um, give us the truth part two, like 
how you had a, a real like you thought you were unsaved at points like at low points of struggling with sin like how does the expression of that theology in the culture negatively affect that and kind of bridge that to what you're doing now yeah i think for me at that point the way i understood sanctification and god's goal for me really had me focusing too much on myself and my ability to prove to god how sincere i was and and not only how sincere i was but how far i was willing to go to make change so um with that sort of understanding of sanctification where yes now as a as a as a non-christian you need to hear about justification by faith alone but now as a christian we need to have talks more about sanctification and when you sort of have that paradigm you forget that the gospel is through and through relevant every day every millisecond every mm. year for your christian journey and then you think mostly about sanctification in terms of um this work in which you participate in what god is doing in our lives um on a on a human level so it was for me in that space it was very fuzzy it was very ambiguous i would hear sermons that would seem to say one thing and mean another and vice versa and um you know from the Reformed Baptist side of things, we sort of drew on Presbyterian thought, Baptistic thought. So you get sort of a hodgepodge of this Calvinistic experience, and you're sort of tossed in between trying to figure out where do you land and how do you understand sanctification. So for me, I think Lutheran language mm. was very, very clear and gave me better distinctions and categories to think about these complex realities in and that's why I label later was able to sort of breathe and relax and uh, understand it. I think in a in a biblical way that uh, still doesn't cause me to be lazy, but it doesn't cause me to look within so much. So obviously you were you're in a time where black men in America seeing what's going on mm. and also seeing a lot of disparities between yeah. how theology is being used and how culture is being engaged. How are yeah. you processing that um, in this time to hold on continually to your faith as mm -hmm. you kind of see this discord with, within society today? Man, that is a great, great question, bro. If you I, had that hot single. I'm, I'm dropping the name of it pretty recently, right? I did a project called Daybreak where I addressed it. It was a single. Daybreak, the leading yeah. single Daybreak. was uh, Set My Sails. And, yeah, uh, Set My Sails. Yeah, 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 yeah. But honestly, so... A part of me was, I think, like many people on uh, both sides of it, was just exhausted, discouraged. Um, but then I also went through sort of a disillusionment or just sort of like um, I came to a point where I was sort of shocked by the response that I thought I was observing by and large from the Christian circle. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of discouraging because I thought, you know, at the point mm -hmm. where we all saw what happened to George Floyd that there was a unanimous a consensus that that was wrong, that that was bad, and the church should try to figure out the best way we can get involved, not make that the core emphasis of the, of the church. But like sure. have a voice in the culture, you right? Me? Yeah. Like we, we got the divine truth, but we got Cora nothing to Mundo, say. That whole yeah, thing. Like, that whole come thing. on. Location, you feel me? And so, and I'm not saying that that didn't happen, but I did observe Oof. In more numbers than I wanted to, people just saying stuff like, okay, I get what happened with George Floyd, but what about the convenience store that was royally inconvenienced from the counterfeit 20 that he used? And I was like, man, is that really the saddest part of the story? Like, is that the part Dang. of the movie that broke your heart? You know what I mean? Um, <sighs> Allegedly, too, right? Yeah, like, right. Jesus moved with compassion over the 20. Yeah, you feel me? Like, that was the <laughs> Stomped a guy out in the street, right. like, in front like, of everybody. So oh. just sort of seeing a lot of those types of responses um, was discouraging. And then I, re I did reach a point where I was like, God, what, what are you thinking? What's up with Christianity? And this thing's seeming kind of weird right now. Um, but then mm. that led me to really revisiting the foundation of Christian mm. thought. And that led me to, um, again, Luther's language of the two kingdoms. Uh, he talks about the left-hand kingdom and the right-hand kingdom, which is basically language to communicate how God is active in the world. In the left hand, he's using 
government and the and and family and you know all these things that we consider worldly god is active and engaging to bring good in the world that way he's using his church in terms of grace forgiveness justification he's using us in the world to bring good in that way and non-christians only exist in the left hand christians exist in a boat in both uh, realms left hand right hand realm so that gave me a, a framework to re-engage and i was like all right God, give me the strength to write and articulate these ideas to bring perspective and hope so the church doesn't just feel like, one, let's just share the gospel and abandon ship, which I think is unhealthy, um, mm -hmm. based on the book of James, mm -hmm. right? He says, if you see your brother, you know, mm -hmm. poor without clothes, and you say to him, go be warmed and be filled, Ugh, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. He, he said, that's a dead faith, you know what I mean? So the point isn't mm -hmm. just to spread um orthodoxy and bid people a good day you got to actually get involved and and give them what they need on a ground level and Amen. um so i started seeing stuff like that and that reinvigorated me to pretty much bring hope to the church that we have language to talk about this in and it reinvigorated me on a personal level to play my part. So I wanted to still preach gospel because that's still the hope of the world but i also mm -hmm. wanted to Go to protest. I wanted to sign petitions, uh, but in a Christian and godly way. Mm -hmm. I wanted That's to right. be a, a co-belligerent, which is a cool word that just really talks about <laughs> coming alongside of someone that you don't necessarily agree with in totality, but you all have like a common goal. Mm -hmm. So for mm -hmm. me, I saw it, saw fit. Maybe if I need to link up with some people that I strongly disagree with in other areas, but in this particular area, we can fight for something good in the world. Let's do yeah. that. That's vocation, that's serving neighbor, and those kind of things got me going. And um, so that helped Man. me to see, mid amongst the sadness, the somberness, and, the, and mm, just yeah. all of that, that Christians do have a role to play, and God gives us energy to get involved. And then joy, he gives us joy, too, with, that, with yeah. being involved. Amen. Bro, hope, praise God on that. And hope yeah. in Christ, it, yeah. It gives us a, a sense of, in, in what seems to be so hopeless, still yeah. be hopeful. And that's Praise God. Super encouraging, man. Love that. Thanks. Great yeah. question. Thank you. Love it. Yeah. So, so I think that's, that's super helpful. Like we need to flesh out these concepts and you found clarity in that Lutheran language, but I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit as the, at the contrast that you see of where you identify in Lutheranism from Calvinism. Because I think some of the questions we were thinking about as we were listening through to your album was like, okay, how much of this is Calvinism, qua Calvinism, like in the institutes or in things like that, or even in like popular teaching and then just like a bad version of some people being unbalanced. Can you, can you kind of like slice through yeah. those and see like, okay, this is what, this is where I stand and these are the things that I've read that I'm like, yeah, that's, that's, I feel like not theologically on balance. Yeah. Good question. I feel like, um, it's a big and broad question, mm -hmm. but it's helpful because so again, so my background is, is more so from the reform Baptist side of things. Mm -hmm. And I do acknowledge that, um, you know, Presbyterian Calvinists have subtle nuances that uh, differ from the Reformed Baptist side of things. So yeah. um, in terms of church history, you have Luther, who is, you know, uh, has been excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church for, and he didn't, he, it wasn't his goal to divide the church. Um, he was kicked out. <laughs> and yeah. um, so at that point, as he's writing and articulating um, justification, he says that justification is the doctrine upon which the church stands or falls. So mm -hmm. in contrast to uh, a, a theological system that put more emphasis on um, your works or the, joining the nunnery or, you know, some type of order, order. or you might be an Aug yeah. Augustinian or something of that, of that sort yeah. to sort of prove your seriousness and your focus on God. Luther, through studying the scriptures, really just saw man, we're saved by faith, right? And then from that standpoint, it took off. And as, you know, he developed that idea further out and he, and he dies. And then later he has um, so, like a, a successor, Philip Melanchthon, 
Um, mm-hmm. And then Philip Melanchthon and John Calvin are friends. And, uh, and, and so it goes. But my point of bringing all that up is to say, so now when these things get handed down to us, you know, in an American context, uh, oftentimes it's really a hodgepodge of that moment. And mm-hmm. at least in my experience in the Reformed Baptist side of things. So for me, trying to understand and embrace justification by faith alone from a Calvinistic standpoint, I appreciate it because I learned that it's not based on anything within myself. It's not based on uh, my salvation is not based on how good I am, how well I perform. Um, that was helpful. But then when it came to language like sanctification, from the Reformed Baptist side of things, in my experience, mm-hmm. there was a bit more emphasis on now that you're saved, it's time to get busy in your sanctification. And that was always a moving target, you know, uh, depending on mm. what book you read, what pastor you listened to, what sermon series you were mm-hmm. going through. There was always this moving target as to um, how holy you were, how well you are performing, how much you were denying mm. your flesh, you know, um, And then you get sort of these big statements that when you push on them, they kind of feel a bit empty with all due respect, like um, Mm -hmm. things such as um, God is more glorified in us when we're more satisfied in him. I remember really shots fired, (laughs) hitting the Christian. I remember hitting me in the pipers. I remember trying to think, what does that mean? How do Mm -hmm. I know when I'm really glorifying God? Is there is there a numerical yeah. rubric by which i can actually judge and measure this yeah yeah because he's saying most so there's obviously some sort of gradation to it right sure, and then you're sure. saying okay so and what, you're probably almost always falling satis- short of most yeah, yeah. Of satisfaction it's, okay it's okay. really not defined i mean most mm-hmm. de- de- pretty much depends on your aptitude your personality your ability to be self-disciplined. It depends on which preacher was communicating that and his aptitude, mm, his ability sure. to be self-disciplined. So it's always mm. sort of defined based on who was delivering it, who was communicating it, what conference you were at. And for me, you know, just as a young Christian trying to really follow God and chase after him and, and glorify him so that I can be very satisfied, I just found myself um, chasing a moving target. And I felt like, God, I can't keep up. I can't. Mm. Hmm. seem to sort of settle in and rest um and that's real i mean who can't relate to that like every listener like anybody who is genuinely like true to themselves and is genuinely like seeking after christ likeness like and what that is our fallen reality in this world what margaret just said right there like you felt like you couldn't rest but jesus says like my yoke is easy to me yeah Yeah, all who are heavy laden by like all these religious religious system of works righteousness and i will give you rest yeah yeah and that was communicated very clearly so I, I, I credit the reform circle for communicating that justification by faith alone. I think the difficult part became, you know, that that was really hammered away at in terms of how God saves us, mm. but in terms of how God is now looking at us and expecting us to function in light of what he's done, you know, the emphasis on sanctification became, this is a way to assure or affirm that you're in a faith. You know, mm-hmm. so so as I was trying to look within myself for that sort of assurance that I am killing sin at a at a at a, a you know a proper degree that I am mm-hmm. you know making sure I'm keeping which is an appropriate thing to do Amen. right like we should be checking Amen. ourselves absolutely um, but therein lies the distinction because mm. in the Lutheran construct um, the sanctification model isn't this inverted model where you are sort of looking within to assess things, nor is it this, um, this incline plane or sort of this ladder where you need to be getting better and hating your sin more and more, um, always on an upward. Um, in mm. the Lutheran construct is more of a cyclical reality that Luther mm. emphasized, which mm-hmm. because of the law, which is another distinction I appreciated from Luther's articulation is the distinction between law and gospel. So God's law... Okay is his holy and righteous way. But when we mm-hmm. realize that we fall short of that, because if you break one sin, you've broken them all, James says, uh, one law, you've broken them all, then that sort of crushes you and then it sends you to the cross where you receive that, that word of forgiveness and you receive um, that grace 
And then, you know, now you're back out with confidence and assurance in what Jesus accomplished at, in salvation, as we would say in your baptism. And now you're back in your vocation. So the emphasis of sanctification in a Lutheran construct is on serving your neighbor because God doesn't need our good works. Our neighbor does. So all of my obedience, if I'm a husband, is for my wife. All of my obedience, mm. if I'm an employer, is towards my employee. All of my obedience in society is, you know, paying my taxes and, and doing right mm. by people. For your love of neighbor. And love of yeah. neighbor. So it, my focus is horizontal. That's where I'm I giving see. my energy, my effort, not this vertical focus where I'm trying to constantly please God, glorify him more so he can be satisfied in me. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Another one of those statements that sounds good in the sky, but when you try to pull it down, it's like, what does that mean? And, mm -hmm. you know, when it when you really push on it, it's they sort of feel a bit empty. And again, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I, I appreciate um, no. my time in a, in a Calvinistic space. I'm just trying to show these clear distinctions in my thinking as to what yeah. helped me break out of that introspective inverted model or that inclined plane model and set me on a more healthier biblical course of the cyclical model where the law crushes me, the gospel brings me life. And now yeah. I go back out to live my vocation and serve in my neighbor. Oh, and I'll say, answer. man, like we, we love that transparency yeah. too. Cause like this is like not, we're reformed Baptist tradition, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> like this is the, this is the tradition yeah. that we were brought up in. And I mean, the theological truths I haven't found a problem with. Mm -hmm. I've definitely like the culture changes wildly Ooh. from church to church Ooh. or Twitter feed to Twitter feed. Yeah. Like that can be a problem. Yeah. But like, I haven't found no, like the transfer, like we're not, we don't all need to be the same thing in the body. Like we got hands, we got feet, we got eyes, we got ears. Like the diversity of expression is mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. I have a specific question kind of on your personal journey. It's so great. Like you got what? 10 albums and EPs out now it's officially is it 11 with the new one. I think it's, Yes, it's all over. I think it's nine albums. Because Extra Nos was ten. Okay, because Extra Nos and the other one were uh, EPs, yeah, right? EPs, yeah, so I think it's nine okay. albums and like multiple EPs and compilations and singles and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so on. And, and let's, why don't you do a quick reset for the audience? Definitions of sanctification and justification, just for kind of terms here. Oh, that's probably helpful, yeah. Yeah, for, for sure. So justification is really God's declaration that we are made righteous, and it's and mm -hmm. based on Jesus's finished work. So God declares us righteous by faith, and that's what it means to be justified. Um, now, sanctification is, is the process whereby which God makes us holy through his Holy Spirit. Um, and it's, it's a work in which we serve our neighbor in our vocation, which that's just another word for pretty much whatever you do, whatever skill set, whatever arena you find yourself in life, you're seeking to do that to God's glory. Um, so that sanctification is where you're maturing, you're growing, you're growing in holiness. But again, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And our participation is only to his credit. Anytime we succeed, uh, it's, it's God who empowered us to do so. Awesome. Okay. Mm. So with that in mind on extra nose, I believe it was sola fide. You referenced uh, who can pluck us. So in relation to that, just kind of clear, I guess what has and has not changed in reference to the, the things you encourage listeners to look at on who can pluck us, which I mean, like the Bible, that like fruit inspection or whatever you want to call it yeah. is not an inherently like bad thing or negative thing or controlling thing. So like on our world redeemed, yeah. who can pluck us? What has and has not changed in your mind in regards to that? Yeah, for sure. So basically, I still believe the Bible. So the scriptures does <laughs> That's say. That's good. That's what's up. It's a good sign. sign. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the Bible does say that in, in I believe it's John chapter 10, um, you know, that no one can pluck us out of God's hand. So I still believe that. Um, but the way to get at it is is when I look at church history, it's been more understood in a way that I feel lines up with the Lutheran idea than Calvin's idea. And what I mean by that is, so when we're talking about God's elect, who God has considered 
in his mind to be his own and which he would preserve to the end. Uh, I had that in a category more narrowly where there were a, a cluster of people who Jesus particularly died for and who he would preserve until their dying day and, and then welcome them into his heaven. Um, but as I look at church history and uh, the August, Augustinian tradition and, um, and, and the Lutheran tradition, obviously, I see that the elect is whomever would believe. So mm -hmm. um, whoever the people are that embrace this universal atonement that Jesus has paid for on a cross can be considered the elect. Um, and those people, you know, God is faithful to ultimately um, preserve them to the end. However, I would say that there's tension in the scriptures that isn't comfortable, but it seems to be rea a reality. For example, in Hebrews 6, um, excuse me, in Hebrews in general, but yeah, also Hebrews 6, mm -hmm. there seems to be yep. a reality that people can apostatize or walk away from their faith. Um, so holy well, people do walk away from the faith, right? Like yeah. we see people do it. Yeah. But it's what is the, the, what is the ultimate the reality that is happening? The reality of the justification exactly. behind it. That's the, you know, that's the exactly. bigger question. And, yeah. you know, and, 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 you know, biblical language, like when Paul talks about, uh, dunamis and others who, who left their faith, um, it seems to be what he's saying is they left the faith that they had, you know, it, it doesn't seem to say they left the faith that they thought they had, that they never really had in the first place. It seems like a lot of mental gymnastics to read that paradigm into those few words, but I understand hmm. where that idea comes from. So, so now when I see those things in scripture, I don't see them as a contradiction. I just see tension in which I want to humbly allow the Bible to be as paradoxical as messy if you will For sure um as it is and not you know uh it was once said that if there was a circle calvin felt the need to close it where luther felt comfortable leaving it open right where the circle should close and uh <laughs> you, know, whether not that's true, you know you can decide that in your own conscience but i can understand the need to sort of connect all these dots Mm -hmm. But the way I would see that song now, Who Can Pluck Us, would be just an encouragement that God is God. He's strong. He's able to do what he said. But my only nuance would be, however, um, I would no longer say that uh, the people who do walk away from their faith prove to never have been with him in the first place. Because now I would see ideas more clearly that push against that. And um, that's helpful, man. Yeah. Thank you. Just for the clarification myself, because yeah. that's not trying to be difficult or a gotcha like that was genuinely like no for sure how mm. how, do, how does that work in his mind so that's that's helpful <laughs> yeah yeah but yeah i i, I think that a, a missing piece to this justification by faith is um is extranos this thing that god does outside of us mm -hmm. which in context when luther talked about justification by faith alone or christ alone or scripture alone all these things were in context of the sacraments, the means by which God applies his grace. So I think where Calvinists, at least Reformed Baptist Calvinists, lean in on assurance of salvation in, in their way, Lutherans lean in on assurance of salvation from the means of grace. Mm -hmm. so for us, God applies grace through these sacraments outside of us with something physical, something tangible from creation that we can see that we can touch, that we can smell, um, we can taste with our senses because he understands our human plight. So he gives us natural things to cling on to as opposed to only looking within to try to remember our conversion or to think back as, and see how sincere we were on that day we, we said we believed. He gives us something mm. outside of that to hold on to. And I see that replete throughout the scriptures where God uses these natural means to accomplish his, pur his purposes. Jesus dying on the cross. Um, there was a point, you know, where For God sure. says, you know, look at this rod and I'll heal everybody. Um, is there any power in, the, in this rod? No, but it's just God's word with this external element. So you see it all over the scripture where God, he, you know, walk around Jericho six times and on the seventh, the mm -hmm. walls would fall. Is there any magic mm -hmm. in the footsteps they took? No, it's just no. the external word with this 
you know, this thing God tells them to do. And then he brings about his accomplished will. So that's what the, the historic context of justification by faith alone includes the means of grace for the comfort of the conscious, for people who are going throughout life who didn't have a Bible in their own language. Most people were illiterate and couldn't read and do devotionals every day. And sure. Know, yeah. So mm. in context, that's right. You know, um, they really leaned in on these external realities from the scriptures. Mm, for yeah. sure. And, and realities maybe that were part of the community. Eh? Hey, yes, yes. The church. Absolutely. Yeah, the one another's. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Well said. Uh, yep. So I grew up in a tradition that definitely, I would say, over accentuated on um, works in a, in a sense where it's like, if a person is saved, these are the natural external things that they will do. And if they don't do these things, they're not a Christian or they're not saved. They don't actually have the Holy Spirit within them. So, and I know <laughs> that maybe to that degree, not everyone has experienced that, or maybe someone is experienced or hearing that from the pulpit to a more intense degree. Um, so what do you say to the individuals listening to this podcast and they are really struggling with the idea of being justified by, a, by the work of God? They're just saying, I don't think it's enough to believe and have faith because I, I need my faith to be the, 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 the almost a synonymous relationship between yeah. justification and, and sanctification. What do you say to that person uh, just as an encouragement to them to say, yeah. hey, you know, here's something you can focus on in order for you to understand that your justification is an act of God by the power of God? Yeah. I mean, one, that's so relatable because you know, there's something that happened to humans when Adam sinned that makes us afraid of the gospel. It's inherent mm -hmm. for us to resist anything that doesn't make us the center and the focus. So mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. already by nature hard for us to rest in God's word. So we're, we resist that from the gates. And now with something as, you know, consequential as salvation, it seems even more difficult to believe this scandalous grace where God saves us based upon his finished work, apart from any contribution that we have, even on your best day where you didn't look at anything crazy, didn't imagine anything crazy, didn't do anything wrong. On that day at your peak performance, your righteousness, the Bible says, is like that of a filthy rag. It doesn't mm -hmm. count or credit you anything. Um, because mm -hmm. again, the book of James says, if you break one law, you've broken them all. So mm -hmm. even when we are most satisfied in him, even right? When you're most satisfied <laughs> and you're still at the same time, fully a sinner, uh, which mm -hmm. is For sure. Luther's mm -hmm. language of us being simultaneously saints and sinners. So we're yep. always functioning in that reality all the time at every time. So I would say to that person, you know, God's goal is for you to really relax and breathe and rest and, and, and take mm -hmm. comfort in what he accomplished um, by faith. Amen. He gives the gift of faith, Ephesians 2. Um, mm -hmm. Romans talks about Abraham, believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. So it's this faith that God provides that is credited to Abraham's account as righteousness. And the interesting thing about that is when Paul is quoting that, he's quoting um, Genesis 15, and he also calls Abraham ungodly there. But Abraham believed God in Genesis 12. So how is he still being called ungodly? He's had a few verses to get his life together. He already left his hometown as an expression of faith and trust in God. He's following God, but he's still considered ungodly, right? So it doesn't matter how far you are into your Christian walk and how good you're doing you're still justified by faith. That's the point. That's what's mm -hmm. up. Amen. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. That's super helpful. And I, I know that can definitely be helpful for those who are going through that kind of wrestling internally. In that mm -hmm. answer, you, you mentioned James. And uh, a thought came to my mind about James 2.18. Uh, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your mm -hmm. faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. How does your understanding of, of theology, especially where it stands now, um, read into the understanding of that scripture? 
Yeah, great question. Uh, you know, here is where Paul, people often pit Paul and James against each other, you know, um, where it seems to be. Yeah, historically, that's been happening for right, forever. For sure. So it seems to be that Paul is advocating for justification by faith, and, it's, and it appears that James is advocating for justification by works. Um, but in fact, those they both complement one another because they're talking about two different directions, two different occasions. So what Paul is doing is discussing how man is made right before God, which a lack Does that 2KR they're talking about, right? Two kinds of right. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, <laughs> so you have a, a Latin phrase, quorum Deo. So before mm-hmm. God, um, it's God who gives us faith. And then we lay hold of the promise uh, to that. He says he'll forgive us. We lay hold of that promise. And then we're, it's accounted to us as righteousness. That's, that's what's going on from top down, bottom up. And then uh, James is giving us, you know, the aspect of us as we engage our neighbor, as we engage this life. And that's another Latin phrase that would be coromundo, which would be, you know, left to right from person to person. So as I do life, I still look to God's holy and righteous law to understand what to do with my time here on earth. How do I live out Mm -hmm. my life? Mm -hmm. Um, And James is saying, you do that by serving your neighbor. And he just does a great job at using Abraham as an example. Uh, When he was about to sacrifice his son, Isaac, he uses Rahab, the prostitute who lied. Interesting, right? And Mm -hmm. she said that the the spies weren't there and she sent the, the guys out the other way. And the Bible accounted, accredited that to her as righteousness. And all these really are pointing towards people's acts of service towards their neighbor. So James is saying true saving faith expresses itself in serving neighbor, serving those Mm. around you. He's talking about how to treat the poor, how to not, you know, give. Uh, primacy to the rich. All these things mm-hmm. are Cora Mundo. Say that again, you know Flame. what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think that's how James they complement one another. So Paul is saying, this is how we're made right before God. James is saying, this is how we live before one another. Yeah. That's, dude, that is really Man. good. And, and also really helpful, like incorporating that. That that really helped me understand what you were saying about Coram Deo before the face of God, Coram Mundo before the eyes of the world, mm-hmm. and and also just the whole idea of extra notes, like how you were saying things outside of ourselves, God is using as a means of grace to help us in our humanness, mm-hmm. and so that kind of brings me into a, a theological point <laughs> that is kind of super nuancy, yeah. and I, I'm just super curious about. And that's, this that's, blew me away. I had no, like, I thought Extranos was like, okay, there's some interesting stuff here, and then you surprised <laughs> us with uh, yeah. you, the you, next one. You yeah. dropped us the real presence <laughs> on us, and and so just, I want to set up for some listeners, too, because I think that- we got this do some is definitions. A, this is a super, like, honestly, kind of nerdy and, and niche theological. It, it isn't like if you're in it and you get it, but like for some folks who, you know, like listen, maybe I just, coming to this episode, I we're just, gonna have to I just help sing them. Chris Tomlin, man. Like, like, come on, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Let me drop a whole EP on real presence. Yeah. Right. So, so right. So like, so that's kind of a thing with Lutheranism. Like, there's a there's a sense without saying that the body and the the I'm sorry, the wine and the bread become and transubstantiation the body of Christ in that kind of way. Which is what the, I thought at first. I was yeah, like, did Flame, it's drop a little an, bit, did Flame drop an EP on transubstantiation? Trans- <laughs> no, Trevor's like, no, real presence. No, 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 so I was like, all right, you take, you take point on that one, dude. <laughs> right. So, so like, but, but the belief that like, however it happens, we, we don't ask that question because the Bible doesn't answer it. Yeah. But like the, the body, it is like, is means is the body and the blood of Christ is really there. And obviously we already told you we're from a foreign Baptist transition. You were there. Yeah. And so I, I guess my question was like, talk to me about that journey. Like, what was the thing that in your eyes was like, oh, yeah. this is what the Bible teaches? Like, when you heard what made you think, like, <laughs> okay, like, this is where it's at biblically, like, theologically, like, this is, I'm I, like, what convinced you? Yeah, I mean, one, I literally thought I was being brainwashed. I thought I was a part of a <laughs> hey, I'm not lying. I thought I was part of a cult. I was praying, God, please protect my mind. I'm scared. <laughs> Um, that's funny. It just Dude, that's, sounds, it that's sounds weird. Man. It just sounds It's just weird. discernment. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. so that was my initial response. And to be honest, even after I graduated, I took a year to still work through things um, because I was like, okay, good. But let me try to, on my own time, work through these ideas. 
And um, to clarify, so, I graduated from what well, I'm, I'm missing that detail. Okay, I'm sorry. I graduated with my master's degree from a Lutheran seminary, Concordia uh, Seminary okay. in St. Louis. So I was learning okay. those things there, but it still took me about a year to process it on my own after graduation yeah. before I really sort of gave myself to it. But gotcha. what it was for me to answer your question was it was a few things. One, revisiting those particular passages, um, you know, the, where the Lord's Supper was instituted sort of objectively, not holding on to my Baptistic uh, rubric. Two, it was looking at church history and seeing that there was a, for the most part, a consensus for 1,500 years across the spectrum, uh, even from the Ethiopian church that never came under the Roman papacy. Um, so you can't say it's an idea that originated from Rome. They were never sure. colonized. Um, so it was looking at that church history and seeing it there. And then finally, it was the the personal use of it. It was like, man, God is into a multiplicity of ways of comforting us. And it was like, why am I resisting this? If God is saying, listen, I know your human plight. I know your struggle. I know, you know, your limitation. I've given you so many ways to know that I'm with you, um, that I care for you. I'm constantly assuring you regularly. And here are four or five ways I'm doing that. And that to me is really what made it settle in my heart is I saw God's kindness in it. I, I didn't see it as some abstract doctrine meant to make things more complicated. I saw it as a gracious God who had already thought through my struggle and sought to provide a tangible, physical way, just like he's always done, right? Jesus even took on humanity. The Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove. God created us from dirt. All of these things, God engages his creation as good. And then I saw the Lord's Supper and the means of grace as the same good engagement of creation. And I said, why am I fighting this? I see it in scripture. I see it in church history and I feel the usefulness of it. And I said, man, I want this. I want this. And, and that's what tipped the scale for me. All right. All right. Yeah. That's man. And that, I think that makes sense. It's consistent with, with some of the testimonies, the, the things that you've said. If you'd humor me, one, one Baptist question give here. To, give it to me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you mentioned the scripture. So, I'm looking at Luke 22, okay? And, and Jesus is talking about he's instituting right because they're at passover mm -hmm. and he's changing it right mm -hmm. um he's he's imbuing it with the greater sacrifice and the greater meaning right mm -hmm. the in, in a sense the culmination of the meaning yeah and so um he then he took the bread verse 19 says and after giving thanks he broke it and he gave it to them saying this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me mm -hmm. and in the same way he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So just two things that I would observe in that passage, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I want to hear how you process through it. Like, I, it's not like just throw, this is not just to throw stuff in your face, but I, wanna, I know you have an answer for this and that you've processed through it, so I just want to hear it yeah. because that will help me learn sure. where you come from, right? Yeah. So, so I'm just saying, so... He says, this is my body to them, when it clearly in that case, his body's over there, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it already says in verse 19 that it's bread. Mm -hmm. And then in verse 20, it doesn't even say necessarily, in Luke at least, mm -hmm. that this cup is my blood. He says, this cup that is part of you is the new covenant mm -hmm. in my blood. So, so how would you, you know, if somebody's coming with that and just saying, hey, like pretty clearly... His body and his blood are over there. His blood's in his veins. Mm -hmm. His body is the one breaking the bread, but the bread's not his body. Like, yeah. so, so it's kind of clear that they would understand it as a symbol or a metaphor, especially on a symbolic night like Passover. Mm -hmm. What would be your response to that? How do you process through that? Yeah, good question, mm -hmm. man. I think one, um, you know, you have this passage in light of the others. So I would say to isolate it wouldn't be the most healthy biblical practice. Um, if anything, it would shed light and expand it rather than shrink it. So that would be one thing. Um, the other thing would be in terms of Jesus's metaphysics. You know, again, there I would say, I agree. Sounds weird. Doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's the sound bite right there. You know Sounds weird. <laughs> but in terms of can he do that? If he wanted to, can can he be standing sure. there um, and the bread also be um, his body in terms of him present in the bread? 
for sure. Uh, he's done stranger things with his body, um, walking through walls, uh, walking on water, dis vanishing on the road to Emmaus. Um, the list goes on. So in terms of what he can and can't do with his body, it gets a bit, you know, weird to try to limit it. Right. And then in terms of the um, the cup and the covenant, I would agree. I would say that um, they would they would have understand through the language um, what he was referring to with the cup and, and the wine. So the vernacular there wouldn't be a conflict because they know in real time that he's uh, discussing wine. This is a, a Luke's account. So you have uh, the Matthew's account, which talks about yeah. the wine. So. And Matthew's account, it definitely says, this is my blood, just for clarity. Yeah. That's uh, you know chapter I mean? 26, verse, verse 28. For sure. You, you, right. So those things are in the room as well. Um, so it would have been understood. Um, but yeah, it is the new covenant. This is something that he's reestablishing. I mean, that he's establishing afresh from what they understand about the Passover. Um, mm-hmm. And I would also mm-hmm. say um, it's not all symbolic in terms of um, they they literally ate the Passover lamb. So when they sacri- the lamb that was sacrificed, they actually ate it. So mm-hmm. it wasn't they wouldn't necessarily jump to symbolism because they are eating the lamb. So Jesus saying is saying this is my body, this is my blood. Um, and even people understood that as scandalous as it was in John chapter six, um, because of the literal statement that Jesus made, it was very intense. So people even understood then that he meant what he said. However, he wasn't talking about cannibalism. He was talking about um, his presence in bread and wine. So in that way, it is, it is um, beyond the human scope to fully articulate. Um, the, the goal is to try to take Jesus at his word because is always means is. Um, mm. he, you know, it's even when, even when you use is in a metaphorical way, uh, the is will still always mean is. So people that sort of skip to the I am statements, um, you know, it's like, well, if I read the scriptures you the way you do, where Jesus says, this is my body, and you say, well, how can that be his body when he says, I am the vine, I am the door? Well, if I read that scripture the way you read the Lord's Supper passage, Jesus would be saying he represents the door. If he's saying, I am the door, then the way you're reading the Lord's Supper passage would have you saying, Jesus is saying, I represent yeah. the door, or I represent the vine, but that huh. doesn't make sense. So I would think I would think that he's saying uh, the idea of a door represents something true about his character, kind of similar to the way the idea of the bread and the and the sacrament represents the sacrifice of his body. But like, but I get you. I I understand. That's a that's a good challenge. Yeah. No, I, I completely get it. So yeah. So so in terms of yeah, the the, the initial question, I think. Um, You know, that's sort of what's going on there is, uh, in my understanding at this point, (laughs) is just uh, Jesus was paralleling the the Passover and he's, you know, Mm. beefing it up in in a sense with uh, now he is the Passover lamb. He's completing it. Yeah, Yeah. he's fulfilling it. Mm. And uh, and he's promising that, which often gets forgotten. He says that this is for the forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. So even Mm -hmm. people that take a symbolic understanding that oftentimes gets you know forgotten so right you know that would be sort of the argument there but yes it, we can it's go good. on for days but um <laughs> yeah sure. i'll check the eps no this well, is this is a good conversation bro, i mean yeah, I, thanks for the perspective on mm-hmm. that for sure because this is one that's super fuzzy and like for a lot of folks just completely unfamiliar with it and you dropped this album and it and now people are talking about real presence on <laughs> on a podcast yeah man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well it is kind of nice to have it to just because i mean the Bible means something when it says those things. Yeah. yeah. So to have something that's not because we don't want to say nah because we disagree with the Roman Catholic Church. Like it, it is a good thing to that's be challenged. Right. And just, just think deeply. Like yeah. the whole point or of not thinking saying, critically. Because my tradition always said like, but to approach the word and and I see I see them doing that. I see you doing that. Like to to come to that point, you had to approach the word and you had to say, listen, like. I'm, I'm just going to be gonna guided yeah. by my convictions of what the hermeneutics from the word of God are leading me. Yes. And I think that's what people need to do. Like that is the critical thing that we definitely like, agree on. Is, let every man be convinced. Yeah. Like, yeah. I love that, bro. Be a Berean. I love that because 
for you know from the reformed baptist side of things you know we don't really we didn't put much emphasis on the creeds like the ecumenical creeds of the church mm-hmm. um we didn't put a lot of emphasis on you know using tradition in the right. way that you find in other christian expressions so I, I got to a point where i was like okay if those things aren't driving my understanding then why am i fighting this why am i in why am i taking on someone else's beef without Mm. you know visiting these things objectively you know so Mm -hmm. i had to relax my knee-jerk reaction to fight these ideas because in my reformed baptist tradition yes we have the 1689 baptist confession but we don't really draw Mm -hmm. on it in practical Mm. everyday life and in, in in sermons and we don't quite use it like that so we're not really a creedal traditional denomination so why am i holding on to this resistance against something that's an ancient mm. idea when that's not even a part of my daily you know use of those things and and mm. that really helped me have an objective perspective and say you know what i don't i don't want to inherit anyone's beef just because these yeah. guys were trying to get away from roman catholicism what a good reminder in general don't too, inherit right? people's beef so like right. we should like <laughs> That beef is moldy, man. That way, (laughs) well, yeah, like that. That inhibits us genuinely engaging with the Word and and allowing the Holy Spirit to kind of work on us and Mm. to to teach us so that we can grow. And I think another thing that you're saying there, which is so healthy, is just because you don't have an out and front tradition that you're quoting from, or a liturgy, or a pattern that you think of as a tradition, doesn't mean there's not tradition baked into your faith practice. Because what you were finding was that tradition of anti-establishment, you know, that that is a tradition within baptism, right? That goes all the way back to the Anabaptists, right? And so... But people, people just do it mindlessly, and they don't realize that they're participating in a tradition. Bing. That's it. Well Boom. said. Well said, yeah, bro. Dude, that's, that's what's up. I, I'm sure the listener's going to be pausing and Googling a lot <laughs> on this one. Yeah. But that's good. That's proud of what we're doing. So, Flame, before we wrap up here, one of the things we like to do on The Substance is a segment called Substance Shoutouts. So mm. what have been some things? I mean, I know it's been the pandemic. Things have been kind of limited. What have you been reading, watching, listening to, engaging with that you found either edifying, encouraging, or even just enjoyable? You got any movies, books, podcast recommendations? What have you found that has been stimulating to you recently? Yeah. Uh, one is the the Book of Concord, which really, man, I, I wish everybody would pick up a Book of Concord and have it. If you have a Wayne Grudem systematic theology or Michael Horton systematic theology, you need also a book of Concord because you just want to beef up your Christian arsenal to really consider the collective conscious of church history. Like why, Hmm. why not access these things that men and women who care deeply about Christ and his glory have really given their lives to articulate, why not consider that and then benefit from all Hmm. of these nuances, even if you walk away disagreeing. So book of Concord, has been really helpful for me. There's another podcast called Being Lutheran that's super dope. And these dudes are not uh, weird. I think I followed them on Instagram after you posted something They're just good dudes. They're not trying to, you know, over the top make you Lutheran. They're just trying to walk you through scripture and church history. And you can engage them and send them emails and say, I hate what you said. It sucked. And they'll respond (laughs) and and walk you through it. So that's been super dope. and uh, yeah, for me, really, other than that, it's just been, I'm sort of like kind of nerdy. So I've been ODing on some some medieval hey. anything, barbarian type stuff, uh, <laughs> Viking type stuff, uh, ancient right. African history type stuff, documentaries. So I love that medieval space. I'm always trying to figure out what was the world doing from 500 to 1500 and all yeah. over, you know, whether it's in you know, whatever continent. So I kind of hang out Heck and that yeah. makes me feel like I'm not in this world. You feel me? That's super nerdy, yeah. but yep. you feel me? Yeah. For yeah. Sure. That's what's up. <laughs> Give some perspective. No, yeah. that's good. And did you, uh, along that vein of the book of Concord, did I see that you recently re- like partnered with somebody to release a Android app? Is that, am I getting that right? Yes, bro. Um, so my homie, his name is Lex. Oh yeah. Also shout out to him, man. He uh, has a podcast, the Wittenberg project on YouTube. So check them out. Um, but him and I have developed an app 
for the Book of Concord to make it accessible, affordable. So if you have an Android, it's already available. Uh, we're in the final stages of making it available for all the Apple users. So give us a couple of weeks and that'll be up and ready to go. But you can get it for two dollars and uh, and just dive in and you'll you'll thoroughly enjoy it. Thanks. There you go. Nice. Cool, man. Um, where can people contact you uh, on social media? How can they follow you? And uh, where are you? Where where can they also uh, get your music? Yes. So my music is available where all music is sold. So all digital platforms, you can get it there. Um, I'm all over social media at Flame314 everywhere. And if you want to book me or see other resources that I have, go to Clear Sight, S I G H T music.com and get connected there as well so that's that's all things flame <laughs> nice excellent well flame thank you so much for your time today and and those words and that perspective man really appreciate it and man i hope from some of this some of our listeners can see brothers who man th- we don't agree on everything but <laughs> you know what there is so much more we agree on that Thanks. matters so much more than the things that we don't and there are ways that you know we can we can walk in that in a truthful godly and honestly like faithful to the scripture way like fellowship doesn't fellowship. need to be disturbed at all by yeah. like substantive discussions so thanks for modeling that with us yeah on tonight man i love it no thank you all for having me for cordial conversation and i'm encouraged man by you all's open heart and uh just willingness to engage these ideas i I love that you're setting the precedent for that and being an example as well so yeah salute salute to you guys trev you can cut this if you want but flame what are the odds that uh cmr is going to ever put out a uh, rewind edition on vinyl because I would I would pay premium for that. Ooh, man, you know what? Somebody else just asked me about vinyl. That might be a good idea. Um, it would be a very good idea. It's just so <laughs> it might be vinyl enough. outsold CDs last year, bro. Really? Yeah. For that reason, it might be cheaper now. That was the the thing at first. It was so expensive. And uh, to match, dude, I paid a lot for that beautiful eulogy vinyl. I paid yeah, a lot. Yeah. So just trying Ugh. to mass manufacture those things was crazy yeah. cost overhead so that might be something to pick up on hey i doing? like well if i can nudge that if i can nudge that boulder down the hill i'll do that <laughs> All right, for, sure, for sure i love it that's what's up all right brother thanks for joining us this evening yeah absolutely man to be continued well guys that was our conversation with flame Woo. and Man, we really appreciated his time and having him on, and we hope that you guys did as well. Yeah, and if you guys appreciated that content and you want to continue to support The Substance, man, we really love doing this. But it always helps when folks uh, join us in support. Uh, The two best ways to do that financially are to join up on our Anchor link in the show notes. Uh, At Anchor, you can support us at whatever monthly amount works for you. If it's just a couple bucks a month, two, three, four bucks a month, whatever. Hey, if it's more, we won't stop you. We actually just got our first $10 a month donor. And that was, that was like, I mean, we've had a lot of great, we just talked to Flame for now. We had an incredible conversation, but I mean, when somebody says, Hey, I'll sign up at 10 bucks, 10 bucks a month. Like that's just a really incredible thing. So you know who you are. We won't shout you out, but blessings to you. We appreciate that. And then the other way, if you don't want to sign up for a monthly amount, but you just got those stimulus dollars and you want to spread the love. <laughs> we are at Cash App, uh, dollar sign, the Substance Pod. You can hit us with one-time donations as often as you like. Yeah, and if you want to interact with us on social media, um, you can find us at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at the Substance Pod. There you can interact with us. You can get teasers of future shows. Giveaways will be posted there. If you have questions, definitely put those under the comment section. And don't forget that we have all of our content on YouTube. So if you happen to find yourself needing to just listen to a video as you're doing things around the house or while you're at work or driving into work, coming home from work, uh, people don't do that anymore because of a pandemic. But you can listen to us on YouTube. Yeah, don't be don't be shy. Share the share the episodes if you enjoyed this. Share it, tag us. We'd love to see uh, the discussion on your feeds there as well. Absolutely. If you want to send us a long form email, write out your thoughts and shoot it our way. The email address is the substance pod at gmail.com. We love to interact with you guys on there as well as the social media. 
And we even have the option, if you want to give us a call, let us hear your voice. Old and man Trevor will take your phone call. That's right. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed that segment back on the KSP episode. Uh, <laughs> and the phone number for that is 913-703-3883. And if we enjoy the comments that you leave on the voicemail there, we will put it on show. Yeah, um, I think when we get to the merch phase of the substance here, we should. <laughs> old man Trevor should be a shirt, I think. <laughs> All right, I'm everybody. Pretty much am an old man. You are that. That's true. I am. It's pretty crazy. All right, guys. Well, thanks for joining us this week, and we will see you next time on um, the substance. <laughs> hey guys. <laughs> it was like, is we having a moment of silence? <laughs> I, I, I know we, you know what I'm we was praying for the people we lost last year. <laughs> Man, you know what I'm saying? Man. Yeah. Oh. Hey, you should leave that long thought in the episode. Huh? <laughs> Just long you got it, bud. <laughs> yeah, that'll show, that'll show you who your real supporters are. They can sit through that long pause, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> It's like, let me sign up for Patreon on that, <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah, on that one. Yeah, let me support this biblical content. Man, that gave me time to reflect. I don't, right. I don't yeah, see that in podcasts yeah, much, man. <laughs> that was a very dramatic pause.